All right, so um, welcome everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about um, the well testing program again and also to give you an update on. I suppose it's it's some exciting news that I um, I haven't gotten to communicate to the group yet, so except for a, a, a few individuals. So um, of course everything's been put on hold uh, because of COVID. Um, so but we'll we'll kind of talk about a few different things. Um, I wanted I wanted to make sure that I I reviewed some things um, that I talked about at the last annual meeting, just in case there are a few new members who didn't see that information before. So for those of you who have seen this, yes, I kind of stole a little bit from my last um, presentation to the to the group, but I really wanted to make sure that um, any new members that are with us tonight um, have that same background. Um, that that those folks who've who who were at the meeting last year do. So um, with that, uh, I, I I need to say that there is no way that I could um, have any of this uh, information to share with you without the the um, assistance of my colleague Heather Sumner Davis, who is the lab manager for our for my department at the university, and then of course my wonderful students. Um, Leslie was back again with us this year. Um, she is this wonderful storehouse of information now about the project. Um, and then Zach Anrude uh, joined her this this year for for testing, and um, he's been also a wonderful addition to the. To the project. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is again information that you know if you are new to the to the group and you didn't see the the um, presentation from last year, you know the well testing program. Um, is is based on this interest in what's happening with nitrate levels in our groundwater in the region. And so in in um, many regions across the United States, we're seeing nitrate levels increase in the groundwater and our reason our region is really no different. Um, and there are you know, it's a personal thing. It's it's a business issue. It's a community issue um, and we know from research um, that land use activities can have a really significant impact on the nitrate levels that we measure in groundwater. There are a lot of other factors that also come into play, things like, you know, what your soils are like and how, how um, you know, how deep, um, you know, what, how the depth of the soil profile, how deep to bedrock, um, where the water table kind of sits in there. Um, and then we, we also know that there are short term effects and long term effects um, you know, for, for different land use activities on, on groundwater. And one of the questions I think that we're eventually working towards with this project is can can we have some control over the trends that we see in nitrate levels in our groundwater? Um, can we, uh, you know, we've seen things increase. Is there a way for us to work together to kind of turn that around and actually see them them decrease? So um, the the sampling effort, you know, we're sampling in areas of um, Polk, much of St. Croix and then Pierce counties. Um, in the first year of the project, we sampled between 41 and 45 wells. Um, in in the second year of the project, we sampled 59 wells and then this this past year we were up to 88 wells, which is astounding. It's wonderful um, and it keeps those students busy. So that's really great too. Um, COVID has ruined everything this year. I just need to put that out there. Uh, you know, we had big plans for getting out in the spring and starting, you know, getting those variable wells sampled um, in the spring uh, because the testing program um, for any any member who joins, we we sample that that well four times in the first year, so we can get a sense of what's the variability in nitrate levels in this particular well. And then if that well is um, not showing a lot of variability and it's really low, then we dial the sampling effort back to once per year. Um, and and for those wells that are showing a lot more variability or are showing really high results, we we sample them more frequently to keep an eye on things. So COVID ruined all of that. Um, it shut down our campus completely. Um, for a while, we didn't have we didn't have good information about even if we could get back into the lab and have any sort of lab an analyses until the pandemic was over. So it, there was a lot of chaos at the beginning, I would say, as there was in a lot of places. Uh, over the summer, eventually, um, 
you know, our, our emergency operations team, they kind of came together um, and put some protocols in place so that we could get back to doing some work. So my students restarted in August. And so that's why, you know, we, we had a January sampling before all of that hit the fan. And then um, we came back for that August sampling. Um, you know, for those more variable wells, we would have liked to have gone out two other times this year, but it just it just wasn't a, a possibility, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I, I mentioned each well is sampled four times in that first year, and then we have just annual sampling for those stable wells. Uh, for every sample we collect, we measure temper pH, temperature, conductivity, which is a measure of dissolved salts uh, in the water, nitrate and chloride. Um, and then most of our samples, I would say, are collected kind of here in these, these yellow um, circles, ovals. Um, so that's kind of where, you know, our so our samples and our results are then biased towards what the groundwater is doing in those particular areas, right? Because that's where we're doing our sampling. Uh, so some updated information for this year. Um, you know, the the uh, these are just all of the nitrate concentrations for all of the samples that we have collected in this project thus far. We have collected and analyzed 374 samples uh, over the three years and um, about, what is it about, um, oops, I'd say around half of them, yeah, around half of them are falling above that uh, health standard. So the health standard is 10 parts per liter in nitrate and that standard is protective of um, infants especially. Uh oh, I'm getting a message about poor call quality, so I apologize if um, something goes down here. Um, so, you know, those those 175 samples, this is kind of showing that break point. Um, that about here is where, you know, um, about 175 samples fall below that standard and then the remaining uh, almost 200 samples fall above that health standard. Now, I will say that this data set is biased towards some of those higher values. So um, please don't take this to mean that like everything is, you know, um, the, the story is is incredibly bad um, because we are sampling those uh, those particular wells a little bit more frequently um, just to keep an eye on things. So um, I would say, you know, our results aren't terribly different from what we see in the region from other um, databases. So this is the well water quality viewer. Um, I showed this last year as well, just to again, give those new members a sense of what things look like from another data source. And the yellow areas are areas that kind of indicate higher average levels of nitrate from other testing programs. Um, and you can see that that kind of big yellow area in the middle of St. Croix County, which is one of our prime sampling areas as well. Um, and this is these are just kind of a breakdown of how many of the samples within these different townships are um, or sections are above the, the health standard, falling above the health standard. So um, we are not out of line with, with what's out there. Again, 53% of these samples are above the, the standard, but um, we are a little bit biased towards those higher samples because we're keeping an eye on them. Um, this is a, a figure showing just the, the average for every well that's in our data set. Um, some of them don't actually have averages yet because we've just sampled them once. So um, those are also included in here just to start to give us a sense of where they fall. I would say that I think some of the newer wells that have come in um, recently are probably um, weighting us a little bit more on the on the lower end of the nitrate concentrations. Uh, I think when I presented this figure last year, um, we had slightly more than half um, or about half of the wells were above that that um, uh, 10 part per million standard, that average 10 part per million standard. Um, and this year, you know, 48 or 47 of our wells are averaging just below or, or to well below that 10 part per million or that 10 milligram per liter nitrate standard. So, um, you know, we still have some 
wells over here that are, you know, you can see the, the error bars on these different data points. So what we tend to see is that those wells that have the higher nitrate concentrations also have the most variability in the data set. It's not, you know, there are a couple exceptions. We can see some more variable results down down here for a couple wells, but um, for for the most part, it's, it's those wells that are showing uh, higher nitrate concentrations that we're seeing a lot of variability. And, you know, that could be because um, we're seeing higher values generally in the wells in, that are in the limestone. Limestone tends to be pretty fractured. Um, and so there could be, um, you know, there could be some cracks or pipes that are allowing a little bit more connection with the surface. And, and so more recent water that's maybe got a little more nitrate in it is getting down into those areas a little more quickly. Um, the, you know, if that were the case, if that interpretation were to hold, then the good news would be that we could also maybe reverse those trends a little bit more quickly. So um, I think those those are wells that are important to keep an eye on. Um, this is an updated figure showing the average nitrate concentration in wells that we found that we were measuring that that end in sandstone, so they're really drawing water from a sandstone aquifer versus wells that are drawing their um, water from a limestone aquifer. We, this is not all the wells I would say we probably know about. We know the the bedrock type that about half of our wells um, are drawing from. But this was really interesting, I think. Um, and and I, I, I just, it tickles me because I love long-term data. Um, I, I have loved it ever since I was in grad school because that's kind of what my project in grad school turned into. But I can't overstate the the importance of having a long term record. You know, if we had been sampling these wells just for even the you know the first year or year and a half, we would have missed something like this. So I, I I don't yet know exactly what this discrepancy is here between the the limestone and the sandstone aquifers. Um, but I can say that, you know, we did have an incredibly wet year um, in 2018 into 2019. So it may be that um, that really wet year kind of affected our limestone aquifer a little bit more. Um, I, I need to, to dig into the data a little bit more to, to figure out why this, this pattern kind of emerged. And then we get into our August sampling of, of just this year and those those numbers have come back together again. So, um, you know, again, we would not have if we had just done one year of sampling, we would we would not have seen this trend. It showed up and I, I, I have a suspicion that it's related to weather patterns, right? And weather is an incredibly important variable to be able to address and um, tease out in your data set so that you're not making your interpretations of what's happening and what your trends are based on just what the weather is doing. So um, those are kind of the, the, you know, key updates on the data that I have for you. I would say a lot of our findings remain the same since um, 2020. Um, you know, we're similar to other well testing programs. Uh, we find that the deeper wells tend to have less nitrate for the most part. Um, uh, that we tend to find that when there are more dissolved salts, more dissolved ions, um, so that higher conductivity value, we see we see more nitrate, um, and that chloride and nitrate tend to be positively correlated in general. It's a stronger trend for our limestone wells than for our sandstone wells. Um, again, maybe maybe showing that connection to some you know surface sources. Um, you know, something new, I would say, maybe the effects of a wet year, we need to dive in on that a little bit more, but, you know, that that really, um, I think that's valuable information that when we have a wet year, you know, what, what are the, not that we can predict that necessarily in advance, but what are those conservation practices that might be more effective in wet versus dry years, or, um, you know, are there practices that, that we could that are really effective in wet years that are also effective in, in drier years that we could be focusing on. So um, here's some, this is some, um, again, some review from last year for, for those, those new members. Um, you know, there were some, and I, I bring it back for, for everyone in part because I'm, I'm trying to set the stage for talking about um, a research fellowship that I was awarded through the Dairy Innovation Hub this spring, 
<laughs> right when COVID hit. Um, so the you know we identified some wells that had higher variability. Um, we have a lot of samples that are falling above the uh, health standard. 95% of the samples um, are above background levels, so most wells are showing some impact, um, some some elevated nitrate to some degree. Um, in 2019, we did a little pilot study using what are called lysimeters. Um, these are little pieces of equipment that allow us to sample the soil water so that you pull a suction on them and they can actually suck in some of the water from your moist soils. Um, and so they were useful in, in 2019 for seeing some of those nitrate trends in soil water. Um, you know, I think one of our concluding thoughts that I, I, I I keep thinking about and that my my fellowship is gonna, going to try and address are that BMPs for nitrate and groundwater aren't terribly well established. I mean, we we know we know some things that work, um, but I, I keep thinking about how much variability there is in the world and um, you know, just in our region and how you can have all of these different factors that come together to affect how much nitrate um, leaches through that soil profile and um, you know, is there a way that we can put together that information that can really make some specific recommendations for for either individual farmers or for farmers that are, you know, on this type of soil and, um, you know, using certain, um, you know, plant uh, producing certain crops or using certain management practices. So, um, and, you know, just as a quick way to say, some of the things that I was thinking about in, in 2019 were, you know, those variable wells again, looking to do more in-depth work with these lysimeters, um, you know, looking at different cropping practices, and then also trying to get some um, information about, uh, a little bit more information about the the context of the groundwater in, in different wells, right? Um, so looking more for filling in some of the data gaps that we have in our, in our data set. And, um, you know, the the fellowship that I was awarded um, in the spring through the Dairy Innovation Hub um, actually builds around um, builds around those concluding thoughts from 2019. So, you know, the well testing program with WWCC really forms kind of the kernel of this this research project. Um, if you're not familiar with the Dairy Innovation Hub, um, you know, it's a, a state funded um, um, state funded initiative that is trying to um, boost Wisconsin's dairy community, right? And um, by um, looking at environmental, economic, social factors, advancing science, developing talent, leveraging collaboration, those sorts of things. Um, and you know the vision of the Dairy Innovation Hub is to to be this really preeminent source of bold new discoveries and talent development in dairy. Um, and so um, this was a nice uh, uh, you know opportunity that kind of overlaid with with some of the work in the of the WWCC. So um, and now we can kind of use it to continue on some of the work that we've started together. Um, and three campuses were awarded the funding or, or are, are part of the innovation, Dairy Innovation Hub. So it's River Falls, UW Platteville, and UW Madison um, that are participating in the hub. Uh, and let's see here. Yeah. Um, so the other um, kind of strength of the research fellowship is that it aligns really well with some of the recommendations from the Wisconsin Groundwater Coordinating Council. Um, they made 20, they made priority recommendations to the state legislature in 2019. Those included identifying those areas of the state that are more sensitive to nitrate contamination, um, assessing the impact of alternative cropping practices on nitrate loss from fields, developing best management practices. So, you know, exactly what we were talking about um, last last year this time um, in the annual meeting 
and then reaching out to stakeholders in the agricultural industry and looking to facilitate on the ground use of research results. So, um, you know, the work of the WWCC dovetails really nicely with what the Wisconsin Groundwater Coordinating Council has been recommending to the state. Um, so, you know, my goals within the fellowship are to help identify cropping practices that are going to be most effective in reducing the amount of nitrate that leaches from the soil surface um, towards towards our aquifers. Um, assessing some of the long term impacts of those nutrient management practices. So again, thinking about not just a year or a summer of data, but thinking about, you know, can we can we get three years of data and, and maybe get past some of the variability that's introduced by weather? Um, can we determine the hydrogeologic or the, the basically the context that the groundwater finds itself in within these aquifers for those for those areas where we're seeing really high nitrate concentrations? And then um, through through study of that, providing some preliminary data about our regional groundwater systems, there is a nice model that was developed by the U, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey several years ago, um, but they identified some gaps in there, and so it's possible that the data that comes out of this fellowship could be used um, to to refine that model and give us better information how groundwater is moving underneath our feet. And then some of the methods, um, just so you're aware of these, um, you know, I'm, my idea is to conduct a multi-factor study of nitrate transport. So looking at soils, looking at cropping practices, looking at nutrient management practices, looking at water management practices, um, using those soil water samplers, those lysimeters again, to, to kind of figure that out. Doing this over multiple years so we can tease out some of those those um, clim climatic factors, you know, and get at how is weather influencing our leaching and then how can those best management practices be attuned um, to those to those those weather patterns. Um, more focused nitrate monitoring in elevated and variable wells. You know, maybe uh, collecting some samples, not just for nitrate, but also for some of these age markers that are present in groundwater. Um, so there are certain constituents that we analyze in groundwater that can tell us about the relative age of that water, how long it's been underground and isolated from the surface. And then looking into maybe using some probes for more continuous monitoring. We know we have variability in these wells based on sampling four times a year. Um, could we install a continuous monitoring probe that lets us see is there is there a really close connection? You know, if we get a rainstorm, do we see a change in nitrate five days later, a month later in a particular well? I think that would be really um, useful information. Um, I don't know that I don't know that we're going to take questions right now. Um, we got to make sure we have our masks on, though. So, <laughs> um, so when there is time for questions, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, I think I need to turn it back over to Todd at this point um, for for some um, for our transition. Yeah, Dr. Well, I, I, I'm willing to take a go question. ahead. We do have one. Okay. Um, Josh Camps asked, how does private well construction impact the resulting water quality? How does private well construction impact water quality? Um, you mean in terms of uh, if, if an individual is putting down wells, do new wells impact water quality? Um, I, I don't, I don't know that an individual well, I don't, I don't, I'm not quite a believer in this idea that an individual well significantly impacts groundwater quality. Um, the, the, the levels of different contaminants or, or constituents that we see in groundwater are really a mix of a lot of different signals. Um, you know, it's possible that if you have a, an individual well um, that maybe wasn't well sealed and it's not located in a good area where there's a lot of water just kind of running down to it, perhaps then that that results in, you know, uh, this surficial connection where you can get water from the surface running right down to that well and entering the groundwater. Um, but I think, you know, most wells need to be well constructed in the first place because 
people are using them for drinking. And so um, I think there are fairly high standards for well construction that um, prevent most cases of surficial contamination that might result from a single well. I could be wrong about that, but that's that's my sense of things because um, we need to keep the you know we need to keep those wells clean so that people can use them for drinking water. So I hope that answered your question. Well, this is Todd. I will thank both of our speakers today. Is there any other questions from the members at all or anybody else out there? We can take, we have a little time for that, correct, Lauren? Sure, if anyone has any more que questions for either Steve Richter or Dr. Jill, um, otherwise I'll pull up my screen for the annual business meeting. I have one question. I the, uh, did you do any analysis of how close these wells were to fields that had commercial fertilizer put on them as opposed to raw manure or dairy manure? We have not done that. That would be a really interesting um, research question. Um, and I think, um, you know, uh, since members have pretty good records of of those activities, I think there's a possibility to tie that information back. I, again, I I hesitate a little bit to to make really strong conclusions about um, you know the the results that we see in a single well um, being directly tied to what's immediately around it. Um, because again, it's it's such a mixed system, and I think we have to be really careful about about concluding that. But you know, certainly, if we have a sense of what the flow paths are, where is the, how is that groundwater moving? It might be that rather than looking at a well that's located next to a particular field, if we find if we could have a region or an area that we know is kind of, you know, the land use is kind of upstream of our groundwater flow paths. And we look at the wells that are kind of downstream on those flow paths. Um, you know, that that might that might be a way to, to tease apart some of this information. Actually, I think your next project with lysimeters in operating fields would be um, more beneficial in concluding what happens there. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I will say, you know, I'm I I'm going to be looking for <laughs> for volunteers here. So um, if you have a really strong interest in, um, you know, I've talked with some folks uh, and have have I think I have some some folks who would be willing. So um, but if you have an, a particularly strong interest in, in being evol involved, um, send me a message or, or tell you know one of the board members and have them you know send me your information get a hold of me um, I'd be happy to talk with you mm -hmm. hey Jill this is Steve Richter um, yes. one I one idea maybe you could think about adding as part of your study with the dairy hub is 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 getting as many of these members and working with them to to track nutrient use efficiency of mm. the fertilizer and manure they're putting down and that could be as simple as yield of yeah. crop over pounds of fertilizer and pounds of manure there are a few other more detailed calculations that you know don't take a lot of extra work but yeah. they that could provide and then there are benchmarks for such figures and it, it could provide the members um you know something that each of them can be striving for and then through time again three five years seeing what if scenarios are happening to you know in to the groundwater well data you're getting based on ideally improvements in nutrient use efficiency over a set of 10, 20, 30 or more of the farmers. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful idea. Um, I'm I'm very, I'm still, <laughs> frankly, I am in survival mode right mm -hmm. now <laughs> um, because like a lot of folks, uh, 
you know, my kids are distance learning and I'm trying to make my full time professional job work, as is my husband. And so we're, um, you know, we're 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 surviving <laughs> this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so I'm still I feel like I'm behind on some of the planning um, process. I'm making some decisions about, you know, different um, equipment uh, that I'd like to use and some of the different factors that I'd like to, mm -hmm. to look at initially. But yeah, I'm I'm open to different ideas. There's still time to um, design some of these questions, the more specific mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. So.